Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Basu and Gade Notebook. Uh, we're March 18th. This is Monday. Arpin, uh, wearing your exposed cap as usual. I'm glad that you're yeah. consistent with that. And uh, <laughs> you're doing it live from, <laughs> from Edmonton. I'm, consi I'm consistent with having unpresentable hair on the podcast. That's, that's my main consistency. So, yeah. There you go. And I've remained consistent. Questionable, questionable beer, too. Questionable beard, yeah. No, I only I only shave when I'm going to be on television. So okay. tomorrow, the next time you yeah. see me on the podcast, I will be I will be shaven. Yeah. Oh, good. Do you do, yeah. uh, do, you about do you? TV in Edmonton or in Vancouver? I'm both. Both. That's I'm good. Doing TV in both. Anytime, uh, anytime game is on a non-national weeknight, you get to hear my um, my silliness at second intermission on TSN. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, let's, uh, well, further ado, let's uh, start with probably what's uh, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest news of the year, I would say, mm -hmm. with uh, Martin St. Louis having to step away from the team for a while. It's weird because he's the, th the third consecutive Montreal Canadiens head coach that has to do that. Albeit for a different reason, mm -hmm. but for health issues, Claude Julien had to step away for a while. Uh, Dominique Ducharme had COVID during the playoffs. Yeah. And now Martin Saint Louis, uh, has to go back to his family to attend a family matter. Um, I, I, I don't know. What's, what have you been hearing? Uh, oh, there's nothing, thing? there's nothing, there's nothing to hear. Um, Canes have been very quiet about it, and that's fine. Um, there's no urgency to they'll address the situation and, and let everyone know what's actually happening when the time is appropriate for Marte and his family. Um, it was it was strange covering that game, to be honest with you, in Calgary. Um, After the game, there was a clear directive given to all the players. They were very on edge to have to answer questions, but without saying anything, um, it, it seemed very it seemed difficult, you know. And there was obviously a lot of coaching done. And, and you know, it's the thing is in a situation like this, like the media, you know, obviously myself included, but any anyone working in the media, I don't think has any real desire to start digging for information and stuff like that. If they've, if, if the, his family, if he and his family have requested or would rather it stay private, then that's how it will be. But it, you still have to cover a story. The story being that Martin St. Louis, the, the heartbeat and the face of the franchise, the, the, the clear leader of the team is gone. Um, please describe the massive hole he leaves behind kind of thing. And, and so mm. I think maybe now going forward, the cup players and, and, and Trevor Tesky actually, I think, voiced it pretty well after the game. <clears throat> Excuse me. Being put in a very <clears throat> difficult situation at the last second. Um, did address it, but the players really were afraid. I think after with what happened with David Savard during the game uh, at first intermission, You know, letting letting it slip that that this was pertaining to one of Martin's sons, um, the players were really on edge. So it's it's not an ideal situation to be covering. You know, you don't. I don't, I have no desire to break that or to 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 get the the, the scoop, if you will. There's no scoop to be had here. I'm not really no I don't think anyone's really pursuing it, but you still have to cover a story. It's a real story. It's a big story of uh, of this guy who has become, you know, somewhat a larger than life figure in this organization being suddenly gone in the middle of the season. Um, so I'm not hearing anything from Edmonton. It's, it's really just, I'm just really grappling with how to, how to handle this situation. And, but honestly, like the, the biggest, I mean, the biggest thing is 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 whatever is happening with with Marty and his family, and and what he's going through, and 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 just sort of wishing him the best. But um, you know, he always says the league doesn't stop. Well, it doesn't stop. <laughs> it hasn't stopped with him gone. So um, 
you know, the Canadians and, and, and us will have to, uh, we'll have to adjust on the fly here. So I think it'll be interesting to see what kind of impact his, him not being around will have. It didn't have a good impact on the first game, but I have a feeling it's the players are going to take some more ownership after sort of the shock of the whole situation wears off and, and we'll see what happens this week. They had a tough week out of them. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what kind of impact this might have. So when you say that nobody uh, is eager to get the scoop, it reminds me of the situation with Jonathan Drouin a few years ago uh, when he, mm -hmm. he too stepped away for, uh, from the team for personal reasons. And there was this old question about, you know, should, should we, try to figure out what it is exactly. And, you know, when you have a team and people that say, well, we, we wish that people respect their privacy, I think it's a clear indicator that it's a request to not dig. And you, I think that from one media outlet to another, uh, people will ponder what's of, uh, of public interest and what's not. Because mm -hmm. obviously Martin Saint-Louis is a public figure, but what happens... There's no more public his figure family. in the province. There's no more public figure in the province of Quebec. He's the most public figure in Quebec. Yeah. So I I think that when it so he's a public figure, but what happens in this case is not of public interest in the sense that beyond satisfying our curiosity, mm -hmm. there was nothing that would change that would impact the public in knowing what's going on. And I think that when people are digging to uncover stories and whatnot, it's because there's an there's an end game there where if you uncover what's really happening, it's going to benefit society. And in this case, I think that you people would see, oh, okay, so that's what it is, and that's it. There's nothing after that, and all you've done yeah. is is bother people that. Are, are going pro pro most probably through a rough time. And uh, so I think that this is the, the closer you are from the situation, from those people and knowing that you, 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 you care about them. Uh, you don't necessarily feel like going through their trashes, going through their, you know, their rubbish, but there might be in one outlet or another, some boss, In the news section, that's that will say, "Oh, what if we had that scoop?" Mm -hmm. And he might send somebody that's not even connected to 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 hockey. Who knows? You know, to, uh, on the path of trying to figure that out. Uh, yeah. But this is the sort of scoop that if the the, the media outlet that gets it, it might backfire backfire on them because it wouldn't necessarily look good. So, uh, yeah, I think it's more. From the hockey side, it's as much as we are, you know, we're we're we're, we're thinking of Martin, hoping that his family's all right. Uh, from the hockey standpoint, it's also what what are the Canadians doing now while he's gone? Mm -hmm. uh, Trevor Litowski is taking over. He's the only assistant coach on that staff that has um, head coaching experience. So I suppose that's one of the reasons why he's, he was put in charge there. Um, But I think that the main thing, it's going to be a test for the whole coaching staff and to a certain extent to the players themselves to show that the message that Martin Saint-Louis has been reinforcing day after day for the last couple of years has sunk in, has been absorbed, and that they can apply it without the messenger being there. And that's... That can be a challenge, especially when you're about to face uh, in three of your next four games such tough opponents, such as the Oilers, the Canucks, and also uh, next week, the Colorado Avalanche. Yeah, and I think it's worth, uh, I think it's worth pointing out uh, what Trevor Lutowski actually does because it's not a very clear role. You know, he's not in charge of the power play. He's not in charge of the penalty kill. He's, he's just kind of there. And so... You know, it's it's important to note that Latowski <laughs> is well. I mean, you know, it's it's. Uh, listen, I'm going to try to define what he does, but it's not a straightforward thing. He's kind of he's the number two. He's Marty's first mate, if you will. He's a uh, he's he's a sounding board. He's often 
in discussion one on one with Marty during games about adjustments, things like that. He's he's kind of the what I guess today is called like kind of an associate coach, even though I don't think that's his official title, but that's kind of what he is. You know, he's he's he doesn't have a specific responsibility. He kind of coaches in a general way, the same way Marty does. And, and Stefan Robida on Saturday morning uh, came out to speak to us instead of Marty. Um, no one really batted an eye because it'd been several days. We've been asking, people have been asking to speak to Robida about, about the penalty kill. Uh, of course, as soon as he does speak, the penalty kill goes out and gives up two goals on Saturday night. But anyhow, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it had been some time with the penalty kill succeeding to that, that people wanted to talk to him. So, you know, we didn't really raise an eyebrow when he came out to speak to us on Saturday, even though it was supposed to be Marty. Um, obviously, uh, later we found out why that was. But he was talking about the collaborative nature of the penalty kill and how his the initial person he goes to to go over what the penalty kill did in the last game, what the penalty kill plans on doing in the next game, and the overall game plan is Trevor Litowski. Um, Trevor Latowski will go over it with Gabida. I assume he does the same with Alex Burroughs on the power play. Then it'll be kind of presented to Marty and, and Burroughs will even get involved sometimes and be like, Hey, you know, like when a penalty kill does this to our power play, it's really difficult. You might want to consider doing that. So Gabida did mention the, the extent to which it really is a collaborative, but Marty's talked about that many times, but that being said, it should not be lost on anyone just how much control Marty St. Louis has of this coaching staff. He is, he's got his finger, he has his fingerprints on everything, you know? And so, and he is obviously the primary communicator, not just to the public, but to the players and they, and, and he engages them in a way that's very unique uh, many players over the last two years have talked about how they have not had a coach who is able to get them engaged in what he's talking about to the extent and to the level that Martin St. Louis does. Um, so that responsibility now falls on Trevor Lutensky. And now, you know, I think Saturday night, you know, we all obviously only get access to what he says in front of a microphone and a camera um, Saturday night, I had to kind of trust. I kept inching my, my phone, which I record interviews with. I kept inching it like a little bit closer to his mouth with every sentence because I just wanted to make sure that at least my phone could hear him because I couldn't because I was so I was, <laughs> I was too far away from him. Um, but, you know, you listen to what he said and I thought he was, I thought he, you know, he spoke, pretty eloquently for a guy who was clearly nervous. The situation was not ideal. He doesn't do post-game scrums. That scrum was bigger than it normally would be on the road just because of the circumstances. So a lot of the Calgary media, or the national media based in Calgary, I should say, mm. didn't go to the Calgary room. They wanted, they covered that. So, and, you know, Calgary won big that night. And so it was like a, you know, it's a big national story. The coach, you know, it's not every day that a coach just, picks up and leaves his team for a family emergency. So, um, so he did pretty well under those circumstances. It was, a, it was, a, it was a, an intimidating kind of scrum for a guy who's not used to the, that kind of thing. Um, but when you talk about impact, uh, you know, Marty often talks about it's our job to sell it to the players. Um, he's really good at that. He's really good at that. And, and again, I think your point is valid and it's going to be interesting to see at what point the sell job that Marty's managed to do to this point uh, has stuck and that it's going to take that the players themselves will take ownership of it themselves um, and the extent to which that Lutowski is able to continue doing that work. Um, I think the players like him a lot. I think he's, he's an important member of the coaching staff that just is in the shadows. Um, but I guess we're going to find out, but he's, there, there's one he, thing that he does also. Yeah. So yeah. Can, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. There, there's one thing that he does also a lot of is, is pre-scouting. He's, uh, yeah. he's really often working on the next opponent. So he's, uh, he's the one 
preparing the videos, dissecting uh, the other team's trends, uh, along with Marty. Marty says that it's probably one of the parts of his job that he prefers is understanding what the other team is about and how they can they can counter that. But this has been uh, on Trevor Litowski's plate um, since they've started working together. Uh, so it's, I, I'm curious to see how the dynamics is going to change because we don't know for how long Marty is going to be gone. So mm. is there going to be a rebalancing of the responsibilities? Uh, St. Louis was the guy who had the least coaching experience, as everybody knows. But because he's got, he's considered to have this such a superior hockey mind and unique qualifications that makes it so that he can survive and even thrive in that environment despite the lack of experience, you remove him from the equation for a little while. And now you're down with, you know, you're down to Litowski, Rabida, and, and, uh, uh, Burroughs. And Alex Burroughs. It's not necessarily uh, the the most. Uh, it's still a very green team, so yeah. I, I'm curious to see how it's uh, how this is all going to go for the next little while. Uh, I'll say it's, it's. Well, one thing I would add to that, and I think it's important to note, I, I, I've been, I spoke to a couple of people in the organization about, uh, you know, one day, maybe adding kind of a veteran voice to the mix on the coaching staff. And someone told me the one thing that you have to make sure of is Marty has to respect the guy's hockey mind or else it's not going to work. And so I kind of kept that in my back pocket, but it, it's to me, that's telling in the sense that those three guys you mentioned are still here. Yeah. So Marty respects their hockey minds and they're the, and just how collaborative they are uh, shows the extent to which there's a mutual respect for, for the ability to think the game uh, throughout the staff. And so, and you would hope that not all of them think the game the same way in an ideal world, they wouldn't, but there's definite, there's, there's definite continuity and, and, and buy-in collectively on the way that Marty wants the Canadians to play. So, but I agree. It's going to be interesting to see if anything changes. Um, you know, obviously I don't think the first game really counts, but this is a hell of a test <laughs> to see how they do without their head coach and their leader. And, uh, and they're, you know, the guy that they really take their cues from. In the playoffs, when, when uh, Dominique Ducharme, left for a little while he was replaced by uh by richardson who um uh i think it was he had not been behind the bench as as a head coach yet at that point but uh i think that uh, it other teams started looking and mm -hmm. uh afterwards i mean uh cal davidson said in in chicago that he had paid attention noticed how well richardson had been handling himself behind the bench during that brief period, and it it played a role in him becoming an interested candidate for the Blackhawks. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Letowski is going to take it the same way. Uh, I don't know if he's he's going to remove himself from that situation and see the big picture of what it could mean for his career. I don't know, but it's uh, it's it's it, it's an opportunity for him uh to to show what he's got uh as as a head coach too so i think that it it cannot be entirely lost uh but it also depends on how long this is going to last and if the canadians for one reason or another were to fall off the rails completely in the next few games in the next few weeks if this this absence w was meant to to extend to that long um i think it would speak to the fact that Right now, the the team cannot operate without their head coach. It would, it would, you know. Sometimes we say, "Oh, we, you need to lose something to realize how realize how valuable it is to you." Well, mm -hmm. life without Marty could help put in light how much how important he is to this team, especially if the team for some reason would completely lose its ground. It's not because the thing is they haven't been winning a great deal but they've gone through 
to through uh through stretches of tough opponents in the past and in some of those stretches saint we said oh it, we've been playing some of our best hockey despite the losses don't forget it, in november they had a stretch there of five games where they played at home they played boston vancouver calgary and vegas and then at that point marty was like we're playing some of our best hockey so far this year then they went back to boston they lost 5-2 in a game that was uh that was a pivoting moment for their season uh but that was that was a, that was a tough stretch after christmas they went on the road they played carolina florida uh tampa and dallas that was another tough uh tough crunch and at the beginning of this month <clears throat> marty compared a trip uh in the southeast to Amon corner at the uh at the um the, the, the masters, the masters. Uh-huh. When they, yeah, they, so they played Carolina, Florida, Tampa, and on the, and they were on the road, and they would sprinkle through that was Nashville, and again, Marty said, oh, you know, we 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 were right in there. We played. We they, there was only one win in there, but they played some good hockey. So now they've got, they're going to be facing Edmonton, Vancouver, and Colorado, plus Seattle in the midst of that, and I think it's another opportunity where this team could show that when they're faced against uh you know tough opponents they might not win games but at least their process will be sound uh-huh. if that doesn't repeat itself because of Marty's absence I, I think it could be very telling to the extent of which uh is is crucial to this team yeah it could um and you'd hope uh you know I think it, it it'll also be telling in the opposite way right I mean, if they do manage to not skip a beat and and play well, and and it'll show that, um, that there's actual learning going on here. So we'll find out. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, and you know, I think it's a good, I think it's appropriate just because of the the relationship and the importance that Marty has had on Cole Caulfield's season. And so the other night, uh, he ended, I believe, it was a 12 game goal drought and scored his 20th goal of the season, Cole Caulfield did. Um, and it's notable to me uh, because he scored it on a one-timer, on a two-on-one, albeit, not like a typical power play one-timer or even five-on-five, but still one-timer. Um, mm-hmm. Just because it's not a goal that we've seen from him very often this season, one-timer goals. Um It's been actually pretty rare considering it used to be his bread and butter. And it seems to me like, you know, I remember last season when he underwent surgery, uh, I did some research on that surgery. And I think the, the recovery time was, well, the recovery time where you, re- you, re- you return to your baseline of performance was something like 14 months or something like that. It was, it was a long time. It was, it was over a year. Um, Caulfield is obviously still in that window. Um, I remember recently at practice watching him before practice, he was on the ice. Adam Nicholas was feeding him one timers and it was clear. He was trying to put them top corner and rep after rep, after rep, after rep. And he, he wasn't doing it. And Cole Caulfield at his best did that with ease regularly. And so this is why I think him getting to 20 goals, like that's going to come back. Like he didn't just forget how to shoot one timers, you know, like it's not, yeah. it's not something that I think there's, he's not going to want to admit it, but I think there's something to the fact that he's still learning how to play with his new shoulder um, based on the research, the previous research on this surgery And I think even Josh Anderson mentioned that it took him a while, but once he got back, it felt better than it ever has before. So despite that, you know, yes, he hit 20 goals on the season, but you look at his numbers since December 15th, which I think is kind of like the mark where Nick Suzuki really figured something out. You know, it's, it's kind of around that time. You, you could use middle of January too, but in that span, Caulfield has 33 points in 38 games, 13 goals, 20 assists. He has 148 shots on goal in 38 games. He's shooting at 8.8% over that span. So even with that heavy point production, he's still roughly 
at half of his normal efficiency. Nick yeah. Suzuki over that same span is at 20.9. Uri Slavkovsky over that same span is at 17.1. That's not going to continue. You know, like that's – Cole Cockman shooting at 8.8% is not something that's going to happen. And I, I think it really speaks to Marty as a coach how – this reality for Cole and, and and it's almost perfectly timed to like spend this season, his first season after shoulder surgery, working on rounding out his game. Uh, he's still going to wind up with 25, 28 goals, something like that. 25, maybe. Um, I just, I feel like this season has been really beneficial to him despite the drop in goal numbers. And I think the way he's handled it, uh, and the, the elements he's added to his game, when, when those goal numbers go back up, and they will, I'm convinced, um, you're looking at one hell of a player, man. Like, it's really like, I think we're looking at a player that maybe we didn't think the Canadians had before this season. No, because of the the added dimensions to his game. Yeah, I, I think that he needs to take solace in this because I was chatting with him before the team left for, for the trip and he was like half jokingly, he said, Oh, I'll never score again. You know, it's <laughs> because mm -hmm. he was, he was acknowledging the fact that his passing game has improved tremendously. And there's is, is off the puck play also uh, has been much better, but you could tell that, you know, in the, in his heart, he's a goal scorer. He needs to score yeah. goals. It's funny. You point out, I mean, I don't know to which extent the, the, the shoulder, shoulder surgery explains what you're talking about. I know that, you know, he's been playing his off wing. He's been put on the left side to score that sort of goal. Yes, exactly. And, and according to the NHL, that goal on Saturday in Calgary was the very first one this year that he scored on a slap shot. All of the other ones were re registered or recorded either as wristers, uh, snapshots, oh. or, or, or tips. So yeah. in okay. pure slap shot, that's what the statistics say. I don't know, you know, if it, minor yeah. officials at the NHL, sometimes they're, 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 sometimes you know, they're, they're sorting, uh, sometimes they're sorting Skittles, right? They're sorting Skittles. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But that's, that's what the stats say. So, you know, okay. All right. <laughs> Well, that's, yeah, well, that kind of, it tracks a little bit, you know, like he definitely doesn't score one-timer goals the way he normally does. And it's not like he's not taking mm -hmm. them, you know? So, um, but again, he's getting those looks. I mean, 148 shots on goal. It's not even attempts. That's shots on goal since December 15th and in, you know, in a, in a relatively limited sample in 38 games. Uh, it is a lot. This is more than four per game. You know, that's that's a pretty good yeah. clip. Uh, and again, he's not gonna he's not gonna shoot eight point eight percent over that span for very long. So, I think in the long run, we might look back at this season as Cole Caulfield's lowest goal output of his career. But we'll also probably be able to look at it as a turning point in the player he ultimately became, which is, yes, a goal scorer, but also a guy who doesn't cost you goals, a guy who's responsible, a guy who creates turnovers, a guy who knows how to forecheck properly, a guy who's an excellent playmaker, who has already surpassed this season alone his career assist total coming into this season. Like, he has more assists oh, this year – No, no, not the, by that much. But I mean, yeah, but he definitely has, has more assists. He had, he had 31 career assists entering the season. And what does he have now? He's got 33. 33? So, so he just yeah. passed it. Yeah. So it's, but still, that was in a hundred and whatever games it was his first two years in the league. And this was in, you know, 67 games. He's got 33 assists. So, okay. Um, I thought you meant, I thought you meant his, his, uh, season best. But no, 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 you're no, right. no. It was, no uh, I mean, his, his career assist total entering the season was 31. And he has 33 this season. So it just, 
you know, there's a lot of positives in Cole Coffin, but to me, the most positive is just how engaged he's been without the puck and how, how many, you know, his ability to read off the F1 in situations where the Canadians are in a position to get the puck back. And F1 has often been Uri Slavkovsky and Slavkovsky deserves some credit in his improvement and being the F1, but Caulfield has really learned where the weak point is, like where Slavkovsky is, is leading the puck to be. And he's getting there with more regularity and he's benefiting and he's creating that turnover off that Slavkovsky four check more often than not. And it's, or more often than before, I should say. Um, it's good to see, you know, and this, and, and again, I think it speaks to Marty. Like not many coaches would look at Cole Caulfield and his goal production to that point um, under your watch, because really Cole Caulfield's scoring has come under Martin St. Louis. You know, obviously they had the disastrous past season under Dom Ducharme. Um, not many coaches would look at that and be like, we need to fix this. <laughs> Most coaches would be like, ah, oh, you've got whatever number it was, 48 and X number of games, like a ridiculous goal rate under me. And people are crediting me for that. Yeah, let's just keep doing that. That's, that's good. you know. <laughs> but it kind of takes a, a guy who understands and a guy who, who had to go through that process himself, probably to some extent, not probably definitely um, to know that it's, 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 that that's not enough. It's not enough to just be a great goal scorer. You got to do other things. And, and so, um, I think Marty deserves a lot of credit for what uh, for the player Cole Caulfield is becoming on top. And, and plus, he's still going to wind up with a very respectable goal number this year, despite his shooting percentage being unsustainably low um, all season long. When you look also at the, uh, at the heat maps, you know, or at where the shot location maps, he's shooting a lot more often from close to the net than he did before. So mm -hmm. this is, you know... Encouraging him to go to the dirty areas and trying to get within the dots, between the dots, is I think that is it's paid it's paid off because not necessarily in terms of the number of goals, but the number of, of chances created, um, it's helped him out quite a bit. And I wonder mm -hmm. also if the uh, the goal total is also mitigated by the fact that. You know, we all, we always thought at the beginning when he first arrived with the Canadians that he could he had the profile of a power play specialist that he would score a lot of his goals on the power play. It uh -huh. has not really turned that way so far in his career, but especially this year, the fact that there are more threats in other in other parts with you know either the, through the bumper position or a slap uh, at the right circles they, they can they can score for, for from different spots it's not just him so that makes the power play harder to defend but i think that there are times i feel like he's used almost more as a decoy than as the general uh, as the the prime scoring chance or prime scoring threat for the canadians uh because the opponents will try to cheat the towards him so he he, he might be taken away but there are definitely it it helps other other guys open up and have their chances of their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then, and, you know, I think, I think, I think Marty and Alex Burroughs have, have done a good job moving him around on the power play. We've seen him wind up in net front. We've seen him at the bumper. We've seen him on the other side of the ice. We've seen him all over the place. The real, the primary, the primary guy they're moving around is Suzuki, um, just yeah. as the focal point of the power play. But that results in, Caulfield moving around. I think it's been very effective when Suzuki's down low and Caulfield's in the circle or vice versa, where they're both on the same side of the ice. I feel like that's a really interesting look for the power play and, and something we hadn't really seen before um, until now. And I think just throwing that in there as a change of pace or a different look uh, can be confusing to opposing teams who are preparing for something else and uh, really um, provides the proper balance that you need. You got the two righties on the left side, got the lefty in the bumper, the lefty in the right circle, like you really have, and the lefty up top. So you really have a ton of options with Suzuki on the goal line um, 
which if you remember like a year ago, we were wondering like, what's Suzuki going to do if he's not at the right circle, it screws everything up, you know, kind of thing. Whereas yeah, the, their success came when he moved off the right circle and sort of started moving all over the place. Um, and so, you know, Coffee's going to benefit from that. Knowing that maybe that they could have found a, a, a use for Mike Hoffman <laughs> during his time with yeah. Montreal. Ultimately, <laughs> They've yeah. done that before. <laughs> although, although I think his performance in San Jose this year kind of suggests that no, they didn't, that ship had sailed. So, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, and, and you do, it's, you're right to mention that he hasn't scored a ton of power play goals so far in his career. Um, I think that's going to come, you know, that's, he's, he's going to score a lot of power play goals in his career. And it's, uh, So there's like all these areas where, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement. And it's, I mean, you look at him like this season, he's got in 67 games, he's got 259 shots on goal. It's really a re remarkable shot volume, you know? And so it's, uh, I don't think there's any need to be concerned or discouraged. I mean, yes, maybe they're, is some justification in being concerned. Yeah, he's seventh in the league in shots on goal. Um, but I think all the all the indicators seem to suggest that this is sort of a – while it's a goal-scoring blip in the, on the radar, um, various other reasons and various other respects, it, it could be a real launching point for his career as being just a more – well-rounded player and, and, and a more productive player because a player who who's putting up assists at a, at a rate that I don't think anyone ever expected him to do. So, yeah. Do you think that uh, Alex Dubrincic has has been going through the same thing uh, with you know first with Chicago and then with uh, with Ottawa and Detroit that basically trying to figure out ways to be more than more than just I mean, a goal, uh, goal scorer, you know. I mean, I don't know. I saw been often compared. The two of them have been compared uh, very often. Yeah, and I know that he's had trouble scoring goals this season. I saw a tweet the other day. Like he's got four even strength goals in in forty something games he's or something. Forty nine games. Been, yeah, something like that. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with Alex Brinkett. I don't watch many Red Wings games, I'm gonna be honest. But um, I know the combination of coming off surgery and everything Marty's been trying to do with Caulfield. Uh, I think have conspired to 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 lessen his goal totals this year. Um, mm -hmm. It's obviously frustrating for him to some extent, but I think he's able to see the forest for the trees and 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 look at his game objectively and and see that he's a positive. There's a positive to it. Um, and you know, again, I think last 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 episode we mentioned plus minus. I think you brought up. Mike Madsen flirting with the Canadians record for, for minus. He's, yeah. he's one, he's one away. You got, he, no. he's at, he's at dash 30 now. Uh, Alex Galchenyuk and Patrice Brisbane look out. Mike Madsen's coming after you, but Cole Coffee is only a minus eight. And again, yeah. I look, I look at plus minus relative to other, to your teammates. You know, like if, if exactly. there's someone who really stands out in the plus minus category, that's what I pay attention to. And. You know, for instance, on the Flames, I'm just looking at their game notes, you know, you have you have guy Jonathan Huberto is a minus 18, Blake Coleman's a plus 23. You know, like when you have that huge of a disparity between a couple of guys on the same team, that tells you something about both guys, you know? And so when the primary people that Cole Caulfield plays with, you have Nick Suzuki at minus 18 or so. I think it's actually a little worse because I'm looking at the Calgary game notes. Apologize, but Suzuki at minus 18 going into the game against Calgary, Slavkowski at minus 19, Caulfield at minus seven. So I think all of them are, are one worse now, but anyhow, when he's like 10 ahead or 12 ahead of his line mates, I don't know. That was just a little something I feel. Some extent. Well, I think that yeah, it needs to be compared, especially with Slavkovsky, because Suzuki has occasional other assignments as a centerman. Well, he'll yeah. fill in with other line mates when Caulfield is not necessarily on the ice. Mm -hmm. uh, so he might be affected there. But yeah, it, I, I think you can, you can take it as, a, as an expression of, of his overall game improving, especially yeah. since, you know, 
his score his goal uh his scoring totals are not where they were last year the fact that he improves on his plus minus suggests that at least he's defending better too and it, mm -hmm. the team on the ice defends better because it's it remains it remains a, a team statistic you know sometimes there's the ridiculous aspect of you you know you jump on the ice and there's a goal for or goals against that scored i guess that in the long run it evens out among the players who play a lot that mm. th they'll be on both ends of that that silly reality but for the most part i mean if you is it the the plus minus is he's, he's helping he's helping defending as a unit of five and i it's so obvious how it's been uh how it's been an improvement on his game uh this year hey i wanted to uh since you mentioned uh Mike Matheson, I'd like to switch to the mailbag because uh, the, there there was a question regarding Mike Matheson. Well, before um, we get to the questions, I just want to I just want to point out, acknowledge that um, we have so Greg McPherson, who did our Future Friday jingle, submitted a Monday mailbag jingle that we, I have not had a chance to listen to, and he also submitted a main theme song for the podcast. We had Woo. Ryan Dorward who lives in Yukon, is also a musician, oh. um, also submitted jingles. Now, we, uh, I'm going to set a time up with Marc-Antoine so that we listen to them both um, and give them, give them a proper, you know, have a healthy discussion on which one we prefer. <laughs> but um, but uh, we are still accepting submissions. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Greg, again, who is, you know, our current Future Friday theme composer. Um, if anyone else has any theme songs they want to they want to submit, uh, basuengaday at gmail .com is the place to send them. But we appreciate it, and uh, we'll be hopefully introducing a new mailbag jingle and a theme song for the podcast um, in the coming yes. days or weeks. Yeah, I'm glad that it comes from musicians because if it came from poets, it would have a totally different vibe to the whole thing. So, good thing it comes from <laughs> musicians. Yes, exactly. Uh, All right, so yeah, let's start with uh, Nicola Cote, who's asking us with everything you mentioned about Matheson during the last, last podcast. Do you believe it is possible that by the end of his contract, he becomes a reliable defender defensively, or will he remain the defender who creates offense on both sides of the ice? Um, well, that's a that's a bit of a snarky comment right there. <laughs> well, I would not say that. My, I, won't, I won't dare to say that Mike Matheson is feeding the other team's offense. He, he does commit turnovers, but I think it's not uh, it's it's not that bad. But I think that it's funny because in the last podcast we mentioned how it was time for Matheson and Gouli to be uh, to be split. You you made a case for that, uh -huh. and right after the day after, what happens? Well, they they're on the ice for three even strength goals scored by the Flames. Yeah. And Matheson's on the ice for another one, shorthanded. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a, there there's a there's a situation there that would ask to be resolved. But I think that I don't I'm not sure that Matheson would can necessarily become a whole lot better defensively. I think that there's going to be he's a he, he remains a, he's a smart player, he's a very instinctive player, and. I think uh, I was mentioning how there has to be a balance between conservatism and instinct, uh, you know, for for a player like that. I don't I don't think that he's going to get that much better defensively. But if they if he becomes through improvements and uh, on the blue line, he becomes a second pairing defender instead of the first line defense uh, first pairing defenseman, then it could mitigate some of the mistakes and isolate him a bit more so that he's deployed more strategically, uh, whether it's through more um, uh, offensive zone starts, uh, less PK, as we said. I think a lot has to do with the fact that he's just playing a ton. Um, and it, it, looks bad, it looks bad on him. But in terms of there's always room for improvement. That's something that's a philosophy that management and Martin Saint-Louis have been – they've been uh, – True, true believers of that, that no matter your age, you can always improve. Um, so it, it can be the same for Mike Matheson, but there's, there's a, you reach a point where 
you're knocking uh, at the door of your 30s you're you are who you are to a certain extent and the way you've played the way you like to play uh your flaws your strengths they they're pretty well established so you don't very rarely a player will completely change his change his style 180 degrees and be somebody else i don't expect him to be because if he tried to be somebody else he would he would lose some of his offensive flair and i think that's something that defies him um If Martin Saint Louis considers that there's been an improvement from the first game to the se- of the season to this point now, uh, what else to say that it's not going to happen? It's not going to improve in years to come. But I f- I find that that improvement has been probably more incremental than well, at least from what I've been able to see. Marty has better eyes for hockey than I have, but. Uh, It, to me, it has not been a glaring improvement from the beginning of season to now. I don't know about you, but uh, that's how I feel about it. Well, it hasn't been a glaring improvement. I mean, it's it's been a, the improvement has come from his days in Florida, and, and again, yeah, yeah, he's never he's never had to play in this in this kind of a role. I mean, we went into this pretty extensively, but it's it's uh, to answer the question kind of succinctly. I, I don't think it's going to change. I think this is who he is, and in fact, I think if it changed he would be less effective as a player. Um, mm-hmm. So you just kind of got to live with, you got to take the good with the bad. That's really, I just, I, I do think there's more, even though the numbers don't suggest it, I do think there's more good than bad with him. Um, and yeah, finding someone else to kill penalties instead of him would probably be a good thing, even though I think he's, he's fine as he's a good penalty killer. Um, but yeah, getting the usage down, I think would help. Um Okay, another question that I think is relevant with today's news. Um, Canadians officially assigned David Reinbacher to the Laval Rocket today on Monday. And so we have a question from Mike Robinson, who asks, uh, where do you think Reinbacher would fit into the 2024 draft defensive prospects rankings? Just curious to see how he ranks up against this year's defensive talent, given the Habs placed so much value in him over offensive talent in last year's draft. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an excellent question, Mike. And one I actually asked a couple of members of the staff uh, all the way back at the rookie tournament in Buffalo uh, because of the way this draft was shaping up, how top heavy it was in defense talent. And going back to something Nick Bobrov told us that when they drafted Uri Slavkovsky was he said that, Not only do we look at this year's draft, we look at future year's drafts and we do mock-ups and we do, we, we do, we do projections and we see, will this type of player be available in future years? Um, and their determination with Slavkovsky was the answer was no. And in fact, with the way hockey's trending at the forward position, um, it might be years before they see someone like Uri Slavkovsky come out in the draft. Yes, they're big guys, but generally at the top of the draft, when you look at forwards, again, it's the same thing this year, other, other than Caden Lindstrom, who is, there's a wide range of people, there's a wide range of projections for that kid. He's definitely a big kid with, with skill and, and might turn into a pretty legitimate power forward type. Um, but most of the forwards over the last two drafts since they took Slavkovsky have been on the smaller side. You know, Berkeley Catton, another example this year. Obviously, last year, Mitchkov, Benson, there were, there were a bunch. And it's it's really, Demidov, another example this year. I mean, really, <clears throat> that combination is rare. So, which got me thinking with Reinbacher, the Canadians clearly would have done that process before deciding on Reinbacher. Um, why would they choose Reinbacher in a, in a forward-heavy draft, knowing that there's a defense-heavy draft coming up? and The answer I was given by a couple of people is that they did do that. And in their estimation, they don't consider, they, they don't consider, they consider every defenseman in this draft while they have excellent skill and are very, very good prospects that they have a hole in their game. And the Canadians don't consider Ryan Becker to have that. Now, my personal opinion is I think he does have that. Uh, there is a hole in his game and the hole in his game is just the environment he's grown up in and having to adjust to this environment is something that we don't know how he's going to do. We're about to find out. Um, 
so, but being a right shot, the combination of skill sets and everything, yes, he's a well-rounded defenseman. And I think that is generally the difference between most of the defensemen in this draft because they all have uh, certain attributes that are elite and other that, you know, I think in, in, in Ryan Backer's case, he's more of a, of, of a very good to excellent across the board. Um, kind of like a conversation we were having recently with Martin St. Louis about Jordan Harris, you know, in the sense that he's good at a lot of yeah. things, not great at any one thing other than skating. Uh, I think that's kind of how they see Ryan Backer, except at a higher level, obviously. Um, so I, I can't answer the question too well personally, but I can tell you that I know the Canadians did that exercise and they still took Ryan Backer. So they're going to have to own that if that doesn't work out, obviously. But I think the way Slavkovsky's developed has earned them a tiny bit of benefit of the doubt. Uh, to let this play out with Ryan Backer and see how it goes. And, you know, we'll have the answer to that question sometime next season or the season after. Uh, but for now, all I can tell you is that the Canadians did do that exercise. They knew the defense class that was coming up, and they still thought that Ryan Backer was the guy to take at number five um, over Ryan Leonard, Mitchkov, whoever else that they could have taken with that pick. So take that for what it's worth. Yeah, the difference I see between – the Slavkovsky pick and the Reinbacker pick is when it comes to the rarity of a Slavkovsky player profile, it has a lot to do with the combination of size, skates, and, and you know, and uh, skills or hand skills, basically. He's got, and this is something that you can, you can project that down the road, look at future drafts and easily say, do we, can we find that, Um, that profile. When it comes to Reinbacker, if you say, well, we thought that he didn't have the holes in his game and other defensemen like in the in the draft after, they do have a hole or more. Um, I, I think that it, it doesn't leave the door open to the fact that in their draft year, there are guys that can make significant improvement. You know, you were mentioning Caden Lindstrom prior to his injury, His season in Medicine Hat was really a, a coming out party for him, and he was mm -hmm. really becoming a very impactful player. So when you have a lot of defensemen in a defenseman-heavy uh, draft, you give yourself more chances of having a guy who could correct his main flaw, if the, the hole in his game, during his draft year. So it's not you because you might have – Five or six guys that are defensemen that will go in the top 10 this year. There's certainly one or two of them that have made significant leaps forward compared to last season. And their trajectory is not exactly the same as it was projected 12 months ago. So mm. it's, it's okay that they decided to go that way. As long as they consider that Ryan Backer was the best player available. And not necessarily because they thought that he would be better than all the defensemen that that we see now because it's it's a uh, only time will tell if that's the case but i just find that it's a little bit apples and oranges you know what i mean with the, with you know, the not, difference with, but it's with not Slavkowski. because i don't think it is because they well i don't think it is from their perspective i think it can be from our perspective but they saw big mobile right shot d as being a player profile that's rare and They're not wrong. Mm -hmm. It's 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 true. That's a rare yeah. player profile, and that's why they chose him. Like that's that's the commonality between the Slavkovsky pick and the Reinbacker pick. Big mobile right shot D, uh, who is already defensively mature, who they will not have to teach that element of the game to. Um, they view, and frankly, I view as well as a rare player player profile. And so, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think. The, your point is valid too. That you look at Ryan, you look at that draft. You look at Ryan Bacher, um, You know, and I think the Coyotes following up with with Simashev right after. You know, it's, it's funny. We might look back on this. Um, you know, the year that the Canadians took Kakiniemi and the Coyotes took Barrett Hayton. You know, both yeah. viewed as positionally player profile 
positional need uh, or positional a premium position. So going reaching a bit to get a premium position. Both these franchises did that uh, under different <laughs> under different management in both cases, mind you. Um, and now, arguably, did it again last season, right? This time it was back to back picks, right? So it was like, um, so it was, you know, we'll we'll see, but you know, the Salayev kid rocketing up the charts. I mean, like, big mobile defenseman. You know, he's a left shot, but still, it's 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 it. These guys are are valuable, right? And so, and the fact that Ryan Brack was right shot, you know, Kent Hughes said it, and that's what enraged so many fans when he said, you know, if he were left shot, maybe he would have thought differently. Um, was it was a definite tell that they were they're after a player profile. They were looking for a player profile, and he fit that profile best. And I think it was the same thing with Slav. Okay. Uh... Let's uh, move on to uh, okay. Here's one for you, uh, Arpin. Josh uh-huh. is asking us, what do the Canadians think they have in Justin Barron, and what role do they see him playing when the team is competitive? Uh, I think the Canadians are still trying to figure out what they have in Justin Barron. Um, the advantage that Justin Barron has is that this administration went and went out and got him again. Right shot D, mobile. It's a player profile they value. Um, so what that does for him is it buys him some benefit of the doubt. But there's no doubt in my mind uh, his training camp uh, was left the administration very disappointed. They, they expected him to come into training camp and earn a job right out of training camp. He didn't do that. Uh, they kept him around. He eventually got into the lineup. He eventually improved his play. Uh, but the inconsistency in his game is something that I think the Canadians are somewhat concerned with. I don't think they're overly concerned. You know, he is still a young player. He's a defenseman with a lot of tools. Uh, so what's his role in the future? Him being a right shot, D gives him a shot to play on this team. You know, the real competition is on the left side. Uh, you know, David Savard is not going to be here forever. Kovacevic is probably not going to be here forever. You got Reinbacher, you got Mayu, you got Barron. If that ultimately becomes the right side of their defense, well, you could do worse, right? It's like it's if 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 those players reach yeah. their potential. I, I see Mayu. I see Mayu as his main competitor because absolutely, yeah. You know they're yeah they're both uh, you know right-handed defensemen who are offensively inclined. Uh, mm-hmm. They have to. Uh, you know, to clean up some stuff uh, in the defensive zone and in their decision-making. But it's, it's going to be, I don't know if it's going to be a race, but at some point the clock will be ticking on, on Baron for him to show that he's he remains ahead of those prospects. But, you know, Mayu, I feel, is probably a bigger upside offensively than Baron has. For all the, the, the qualities, the passing qualities that they see in Baron, I think that they perceive him as being possibly the best passer that they've got in their system. Mm-hmm. Um, but does it translate necessarily in more offense or a, a bigger impact on the game? I'm not sure. But if you have two guys that have defensive warts and one is producing more offense than the other and is more physical too, then the choice uh, the remains becomes easier to, to make. <laughs> so... It's uh yeah I I I see in the long run I cannot speak for the Canadians but I see Justin Barron possibly being candidate for a trade that would be my guess uh yeah maybe I mean he I'm just looking at it now and <clears throat> he's a uh, he's going to be probably waiver eligible at the beginning of next season. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you were talking about sort of a deadline for him. Uh, That would be one of them. Um, Now I'm not sure. Is it, is it seasons and games played or seasons or games played for waiver exemption? 
Uh, it's, that- it's for 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 a skater. I think it's only game played, and they, there's a um, well, there's, there's seasons. A, there's a, a seasons, seasons component to it. Three seasons, 160 NHL games played. So, but yeah, according to Cap Friendly, it says estimated waivers required beginning 2024 25. Don't know why that is, but okay. anyhow. So, um, so there you go. Like that's kind of his deadline. When he becomes waiver eligible, um, they're gonna have to make a call on him. They're not gonna want to lose him on waivers. So if you talk about him getting traded, it's gonna be it's gonna be tied to his waiver eligibility. Um which presumably he will not have hit right at the start of next season. Like he probably has a few more games that he has to play, but uh but if it is right off the bat, because it's his third professional season, um that's gonna that's gonna go a long way. You know, it's it's we'll see we'll see. I I, I yeah, agree it's, with it's, you that, that it's Mayu seasons. it's seasons, yeah. It's season it's seasons or game NHL games played. It's it's right. the first the first marker that you hit between the two. Okay. So he's hitting that marker right off the bat next season. So yeah. that definitely complicates things for him. Um and for everyone else. And what's I mean, you know, and obviously Mayu has three more seasons before he needs waivers or 160 NHL games played. So it's it's not been the season that Justin Barron hoped for. He wouldn't stop saying at the rookie tournament how he has nothing left to prove in the AHL. He needs to be playing in the NHL. And where does he wind up? He winds up in the AHL. So he, you know, needs to take a step forward here. Um, we had an interesting question here uh, from Daniel Nguyen, who we've, uh, we, we've answered one of his questions in the past. Uh, but I thought it was, I thought it would be a good discussion, especially with what's going on with Marty leaving the team. So question is, uh, what is culture? The reason I'm asking this is that it sounds like the Canadians didn't have a culture before this rebuild. Is that an indictment of the previous regime? Is it an indictment of the legacy that Weber and Carey Price couldn't leave when they left? If culture is so important to success, how come Pittsburgh, with a winning culture instilled by their future Hall of Famers, are struggling to make things work? Is culture just a lazy buzzword being used when it's convenient to justify a team's success? Is it 2024's character? Good question, Daniel. I'm sure that there, yeah, I'm sure there are people who think that culture is a, a lazy buzzword. I don't, uh, but it's like. Uh, Culture is a bit like uh, culture is a bit like pornography, right? So it's hard to describe, but when you see it, you know what it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so culture, yeah, I, I think that the 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 Weber and Price aspect to uh, to the component of your question is really relevant um, because that was the prime the the prime bet that Mac Bergevin made when he acquired. Uh, Weber, when he extended Price, he said the impact of those guys and their impact on the culture of this when team he extended Gallagher. will be that too will yeah. be felt long after they're gone. Mm-hmm. That was that was his mindset, and I was ready to believe him because basically you have a uh, people, you have veterans that are so respected that they establish a a a work ethic. A mindset, a level of preparation to their game that uh, that influences younger teammates, and in their turn, they copy those habits, and so the wheel turns. That's the idea. But the the problem is that the minute that Weber and Price left, uh, that culture uh, went out the door too. So it did not carry over the way that it was expected, and I think that it's. I, I don't know if there was just a beyond those two guys, if there was just a lack of leadership, not enough guys to to carry the pole and, and make the, an, an effective transition. But it's definitely one of the factors why the drop was so huge between a somewhat unexpected uh, presence in the Stanley Cup final. But certainly... I think that that culture played a role in how they managed to rally and mm. a- against the Leafs and had that long run in the playoffs. 
But the fact that they started from there and they they dropped all the way down at the bottom of the standings, uh-huh. I think that the fact that the culture did not carry over had something to do with it. So I'm not going to sit here and say culture is overrated and culture doesn't exist. I think that it does. I think that's what Martin St. Louis is trying to implement uh, this season. But it's also the fact that it starts from the top, from your coaching staff that is uh, selling ideas and and concepts and, and ways of behaving that is sustained by younger leaders that are there for the long while that adhere to those concepts and those ideas. I think that it makes something that is probably stronger than just asking one guy that's been transplanted from one organization to another to say, here, you're going to be our culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if one guy was enough, and I'm talking here about Shea Weber, to really have such a big impact and once he was gone, he would carry over because evidently it did not. No, it's worth pointing out that there are only six players remaining on this team that played in the 2021 Stanley Cup final. Uh, Jake Evans, Brendan Gallagher, Nick Suzuki, Cole Caulfield, Yoel Armia, and Josh Anderson. So uh, that's a remarkable turnaround in less than three years. So I think that also has something to do with it to some extent. Uh, where, but, you know, when I, and, and I think Daniel's point about the Penguins is fair. Uh, you know, you can have the best culture in the world. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, it loses every time to father time. Father time is, is undefeated as, as we like to say. Uh, but the opposite end of it, I think is also true. Uh, in terms of a bad culture, like the Buffalo Sabres, for instance, um, I remember talking to Kyle Akposo about this at the beginning of last season and talking and him just really passionately talking about the, the need to, you know, remove some elements who maybe aren't bought in as well, you know, hint, hint, you know, reminds like <laughs> rhymes with bicycle, you know, kind of thing. So it's like, yeah. Um, and, but just how difficult it is to cultivate it, how difficult it is to create that, that element in your team that has everybody pulling on the same rope that has everyone going the same direction. Um, you know, that team needed Rasmus Dahlin to take a step. Uh, it's, it's, and they're still not out of it, you know? And so like, I think, I think it can be a buzzy word, but I think it's a real thing when you're trying to go through a rebuild and you're used to losing a lot that paying attention to culture paying attention to complacency, paying attention to uh, accepting loss, accepting losing uh, is important, you know, and, it, it, and it's something that organizations have to really be mindful of. And I really do think the Canes are mindful of it. Uh, I think Nick Suzuki in particular, but Cole Caulfield as well. The guys, you know, those are the two young guys out of the six guys I mentioned who have been here since who played in the 2021 cup final uh, the, they're the two core guys, right? I mean, Gal Gallagher and Anderson's contract makes them de facto core guys, I guess, but the core guys are Cole, Caulfield, and Nick Suzuki. And I think the, the organization is sensitive to, to them getting sick of this. And it's, it's important to be sick of this. And it, that's the kind of thing, like, that's, it's hard not to look at the situation in Buffalo where it was more of the same year after year after year. I think it would be human nature at some point to just be like, you know what? We're just not very good. We're not going to be very good. This is just how it is. So we're going to lose a lot. And, you know, maybe not consciously think that, but subconsciously be like, where is the end of this road? What is happening here? How do we get to the next step? Um that has something to do with culture. You know, I mean, that is, and that's, you know, right now, whereas Shea Weber and Carrie Price were the main purveyors of that culture before that's Marty. Now. That's Marty's, that's Marty's domain. That's where he and Trevor Letowski brought it up. How they talked about it yesterday, or sorry, Saturday before the game, uh, the culture that they've built here. Well, now it's time to, it's time to see that culture in action. It didn't work out Saturday night. But as we mentioned off the top of the show, we're going to see 
to what extent that culture is there without the main purveyor of it being there. So I think that's culture. I think the culture term is a buzzword, but what it means is not buzzy. It means just to creating a set of standards. You have standards as an organization, you have standards as a team, you have standards as a dressing room, and it's up to the people in that dressing room to uphold those standards. And that's what culture is. It's a, it's a set yeah. of standards that you adhere to and not letting them slip is how you maintain a culture. When you look at the, either Martin St. Louis or can't use, I think, and probably even Jeff Gorton, um, there's a great deal of admiration towards what the Boston Bruins have been able to do over time. Mm -hmm. When you talk about a, a culture that's been able to transmit itself, you know, from the group that won the Stanley Cup, from the, the Zeno shower years to Patrice Bergeron taking over. And now Patrice Bergeron being gone and the standards remain so high in Boston, despite the fact that on paper, it's not as strong a team as it once was. Mm -hmm. uh, Brad Marchand has been able to perpetuate that idea. Now you've got other leaders like M McAvoy and Pasternak also that have joined in, but they've been able, you know, M Marty says uh, occasionally, we want to instill a, a type of play and a type of culture that whoever you put in, they'll jump on the train. Even mm -hmm. if the train is ongoing, they'll be, they'll be able to, to join in and participate. They won't be lost because there's something that's clear and that, that is identifiable to the Montreal Canadiens. And I think that in that sense, the Boston Bruins are a very good uh, example of that because that, continuous level of excellence is started with a strong culture that's been able to be passed on. Um, and it's, it's funny because it changes, it changed from players to players, but it also uh, co it was cultivated from one coach to another, you know, yeah. because it, it went from Claude Julien to Cassidy, now to Montgomery. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. And I think that's what the Canadians are aspiring to accomplish. Because teams with bad culture, you mentioning Buffalo, I know that the Nashville Predators at some point went to a, a, a patch where, a rough patch where they thought that their culture really needed to be fixed. Uh, you look at, at Columbus, they at really Ottawa. struggle with that. Ottawa, same Ottawa, thing. Ottawa, so the, yeah. Yeah. So those teams, you know, there's, there's a correlation at some point. Not every bad team is bad because of its culture, but some teams, Don't figure it out because they cannot implement a positive culture despite their, their best efforts. So it's, it's a real, it's a riddle. And yeah, and just final point on this, but just because a good culture expires at some point, like Daniel mentioned, Pittsburgh, uh, doesn't mean that it's not important. It's, it's just that everything expires at some point. You know, I, I had time to, you know, I sat down with John Cooper when the Canes were in Tampa. That's another instance of, you know, John Cooper's been there throughout. He's been the constant, but players have come and gone there. They've had, they've been kind of ravaged by the salary cap in Tampa, but that's a winning culture, a winning culture that another one that Marty has mentioned that they would like to emulate in Montreal. But, you know, everything has an expiry date. You can't just, it's not, winning culture is not just going to endlessly perpetuate itself. But there's no way you could make the argument that there was not a, that the culture in Tampa did not in some way contribute to their incredible run of success over a five year period. Um, that's real. Yes, they had excellent players. Yes, they had excellent management. They had they 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 manipulated the salary cap brilliantly. They they had an excellent coach. They had they had they they had a lot of factors go in their favor. But Julian Breezeball made a lot of trades and they brought in a lot of people over those years. And they just entered into the fold and and began swimming upstream with the rest of the school of fish. You know, it was like it was really and that's called that's what culture is. That's what it's about. Yeah. Is 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 what the Lightning have done and the Bruins have done. You know, the Bruins, like one of their primary forwards now is Pavel Zaka, you know, and he, and he they got him kind of as a cast off from New Jersey and boom. He enters into the Bruins culture, is actually a perfect player for the way they play. Um, doesn't skip a beat, you know? It's 
Yeah. Uh, Danton Heinen's like an incredibly effective player in Boston, whereas he was kind of a middling, middle six, borderline bottom six guy uh, elsewhere. You know, fits perfectly there. Uh, you know, yeah. Tampa and Tampa's frankly the way things are shaping out this year. Like if you if you finish first in the Eastern Conference, the way it's looking like the Florida Panthers will do. Like what kind of reward would it be? If they wind up getting the Tampa Bay Lightning right now, it's not looking like that's going to be the case. Like Tampa's probably going to get the winner of the Metropolitan. Um, although yeah. the, the Metro, the, you know, the Rangers could could pass Florida and Boston. Boston's actually technically first in the East right now. But whoever gets Tampa in the first round, you will have had one hell of a season, like a great season. Either you've won the Metropolitan or you've won the Atlantic. Maybe you've won the. Maybe you finished first in the Eastern Conference, and your reward. Is the Tampa Bay like in the first round of the playoffs? Like, what is that all about? And and good luck yeah. with that. Like, good luck with that. Seriously, like, it's. I'm not a betting guy. I don't want pay attention. The people who are, depending on what the odds are, I would throw a little bit down on Tampa. You know, <laughs> like I mean, it's it's in whatever series they wind up in. Like, it's it's not a bad bet. And the, and the reason for that is is their culture. That's what it's about. That's what that's that's why I think it's not a bad bet. Right. All right. Uh, maybe uh, one more. There's here. There's one from uh, Mathieu Bertrand who's asking us: Do you know how scouting teams evaluate the difference between leagues and player production? Is it through conversion tables, or do they just try to scout the player's abilities and try to translate it to another league? Uh, you know, the 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 Q, the OHL, WHL, European leagues, etc. Uh, so thank you, Mathieu, for that question. There's a, I guess there's both are true because there is indeed uh, scouting the players' abilities. That that's the first uh, that that's the first item. Uh, being able to project how those abilities could translate at the higher level is is part of the uh, the secret recipe, and it's uh, the puzzle to figure out. But I'll I'll, uh, I'll just focus on the, uh, when you mentioned conversion tables. Um, so there's data obviously that comes into play. Um, some items, some things are, are available publicly, but some things obviously are more uh, detailed and built up by each individual team. So let's say in the public sphere, you have um, uh, statistical uh, websites that will talk about NHL equivalencies, NHL E. Uh, so there are formulas basically that are developed so that there are some statistics that you can apply if a kid does, you know, X, Y, Z in a certain league, if you were to, you, you can bring it to an equivalence to other, uh, other leagues that are either more defensive, more offensive, uh, that are populated with older players and whatnot, but in-house. And it, when we speak about the Montreal Canadians specifically, um, They do weigh the different leagues. That's part of their evaluation process. Uh, I'm talking here about analytics, but it's a small uh, part of the evaluation process. And probably w what's a bigger part or what's considered more valuable in their evaluation is the usage of the player. So we're talking about zone starts. We're talking about uh, the strength of opposition, the strength of teammates. So they they will blend in everything and come with a, a, a satisfying answer when they have a decent enough sample size. But the more data that's being analyzed these days, uh, they need they need more information. So right now it's a really a work in progress into understanding, putting those equivalencies at play because It's not obviously. It's not more than just. Uh, it's it, it's more than just goals and assists. Now, as everybody knows, there there are some uh, metrics that are developed. Arpen, earlier in the year, you were talking about the OGPs when we had a um, mm -hmm. an episode on Nick Suzuki in, in December. Uh, so there's tons of metrics that uh, Chris Boucher, for example, with the Montreal Canadiens, have developed. So I think it's going to take time. It's it, it's not going to be resolved all of that issue is not going to be resolved rapidly because they're building data sets that are meant to become better uh, or or more robust as as the years improve so 
they're trying to compare all the leaks, but as they gather more data over time, it's going to be more and more refined, but it's very much a work in progress when it comes to uh, the, those conversion tables that you're talking about. Okay, not um, much for me to add to that. Thank it. you for yeah. thank you for all the questions, guys. That was really great. Um, so yeah, big week ahead for the Canadians. We're going to see uh, how they measure up against two of the top teams in the league. But by the time we speak to you next, I'll be in Vancouver for Friday's episode. We'll know what happened against Edmonton on Tuesday night and against Vancouver on Thursday night by that point. So until then, enjoy your week and uh, we will talk to you on Friday.